Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let us run the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, about the newest survivor to enter the game. The South Korean music producer, Yun Jin Lee. Yun Jin hit live servers as part of Chapter 19, All Kill, released on March 30th, 2021, which is at time of writing, Dead by Daylight's most recent release. I've already discussed my mixed feelings on her counterpart killer, Ji Woon Huk, aka the Trickster, in an earlier video, so if you haven't seen it and want to know, I suggest you do so. In that video, I promised I'd make a video about the chapter's survivor once she went live, and here I am now, fulfilling my promise. Now that the chapter has been out for just over three weeks at the time of writing, I think it's safe to say that, for all the hype, all kill has been pretty much dead on arrival. There's been a number of factors behind this, the Trickster being possibly the weakest killer on launch that Behaviour has ever put out, the leaks of a Left 4 Dead event and Crypt TV skins coming in the next update, a large mid-chapter patch on the PTB with some… divisive changes, and the Resident Evil chapter confirmed to be on the horizon, which has caused my channel to absolutely explode in the past week or two, so no complaints from me on that one. In all of this, the Trickster has largely been written off, which is kinda sad. After the twins came out to a… um… lukewarm reception, a lot of people were really looking for something they could enjoy after that, and the Trickster really didn't fill that role. And it's not even like the twins, where he offers something really unique that a small group of frat hits can latch onto, because he's kinda of derivative of other killers that came before. There's a reason I call him Plague Without a Soul in my last video, but while this chapter's killer is a bit of a letdown, I think it still has something good to offer. Yun Jin is really quite remarkable, because it's the first time in the history of Dead by Daylight that a chapter's survivor has actually outshone their killer, at least in my opinion. I talked about this before in my UE video, when Behaviour had a problem with making their survivors for a very long time. Until UE came out, Dead by Daylight's survivors often lacked something that the killers had. Purpose. We couldn't really care about them or see them as people, because they were kind of flat. Some more so than others, but to some degree, every survivor until Yui felt incomplete. Despite the tones being a little hit or miss when it comes to survivors, Behaviour has massively upped their game when designing the characters of new survivors since Yui. Zarina, Felix, Elodie, and Yun Jin are all well rounded and interesting characters who feel like actual, properly realised people. And Yun Jin is the final proof that Behaviour really knows what they're doing now they're able to properly write survivors. So let's talk about why. When creating All Kill, Behaviour decided to return to something they tried only once before, giving the killer and survivor a personal relationship where they knew each other before entering the fog. This has only been done once before. Frank Morrison of the Legion paid Jeff Johansson to paint a mural on the Legion's hideout, the abandoned Mount Ormond ski resort. And that was Jeff's first commission and set him up to be a professional artist. But Yun Jin and Ji Woon take it a step further, because Jeff and the Legion didn't need to meet. Jeff could have gotten his start as an artist without Frank specifically being the one who commissioned him, and the Legion mural could have been painted by anyone, or not at all, and it wouldn't have changed their story either. But Yun Jin and Ji Woon are key players in each other's stories. You kind of have to read both to get a proper understanding of either of them. I, I read Ji Woon's lore first, and I kind of regret that. I feel like I'd have gotten the full effect of Ji Woon's law better if I'd have started with Yun Jin's. But one of my big complaints about Ji Woon's law was how he didn't feel like his character was in any way shaped specifically by the world of K-pop. He doesn't really feel like an organic part of his world, because nothing about his personality or his actions is necessarily unique to K-pop. I am pleased to report I cannot say the same for Yun Jin. Much like Ji Woon, Yun Jin's story starts in childhood but does something far more interesting with it, while Ji Woon's youth is defined by him learning his knife trick as a way to justify his in-game power, Yun Jin's childhood does something more important. It loads her up with a purpose that's not just understandable, but relevant to the specific context of K-pop. Both of them are ambitious, but Ji Woon is ambitious because he's an attention seeker. Anyone can be an attention seeker, it doesn't need to be specific to the K-pop industry. But Yun Jin, on the other hand, Music is how she and her sister coped with their miserable childhoods at the bottom of society. To her, K-pop is represented not just as a way to show off, but a way out. And that's actually how K-pop is marketed to a lot of young people in Korea. 
It's often advertised as a form of meritocratic social mobility to allow young people to elevate their status, which is one of the reasons they start recruiting so young. Yun Jin feels like an organic part of her world because to her, K-pop is treated both as a form of artistic expression and a means for her to climb the social ladder. It both showcases and justifies her nature as an opportunistic social climber in the dog-eat-dog -dog world of K-pop. When Mighty One Entertainment auditioned Yun Jin at the age of 17, the executives turned her away from the Idol Academy she was trying to get into in favour of offering an unpaid internship at the company. Ah, unpaid internship. A term that sends shivers down the spine of any young job seeker, but it's enough to spur on Yun Jin to her dogged pursuit of success. During her time climbing up Mighty One's hierarchy, Yun Jin never gets any free passes or unearned leg ups. Everything she gets, she has thoroughly earned. We gain a serious respect for her tenacity as she goes the extra mile to ensure she gets the recognition that she deserves. Recognition that led her to No Spin, a boy band that was foundering under Mighty One's label. This is where Ji Woon enters her story, the dash of wildness that thrusts No Spin to stardom under Yun Jin's management. The two would go on to define each other's professional futures, as we saw when Ji Woon's bandmates died in the fire that burned down the No Spin recording studio. Only once Yun Jin had saved herself did she realise that the entire band, except from Ji Woon, had perished in the blaze. At this point, if you know nothing about Ji Woon, Outside of what Yun Jin's law tells you, alarm bells might start to ring. Ji Woon was in the building with the other bandmates, and yet he survived and they didn't? This is where keeping the story focused on Yun Jin actually makes the overlap better between their two stories, because Yun Jin doesn't have complete information, so the reader doesn't either. Someone who'd only read Yun Jin's law might have thought that Ji Woon started the fire, but while his story reveals he's responsible for his bandmates' deaths, he didn't actually start it in the first place. And if you had read both, the dramatic irony that we know something the characters don't elevates the story's tension. It's Hitchcock's bomb under the table as we wait for Yun Jin to realise what we already know, that Ji Woon didn't start the fire. Not that Yun Jin really knew or cared who started the fire at this point. What mattered to her was her professional future, and by extension, that of Ji Woon. He was her meal ticket now, and she had to make the best of it. So without the knowledge of Mighty One executives, she recorded a series of tracks with Ji Woon to reignite his career as a solo act, known as The Trickster. With a new, more edgy sound, and a masterful rebranding campaign by Yun Jin, The Trickster was met with huge success, and with success eventually came a world tour. That's when the murders started. Mutated corpses started to show up in the cities they visited, flamboyant displays of gruesome murder that caused Yun Jin to worry about her star's safety. Again, as their stories run parallel to each other, we get some more dramatic irony. We know that Ji Woon is behind these murders, but Yun Jin doesn't. All we get to see is how she reacts to them, and that illustrates more about her character while maintaining that tension. She doesn't do what someone like Elodie or Zarina would do and investigate those deaths, she just does her best to keep herself and what's most important to her safe, and doesn't think on it beyond that, at least not for now. Even as the clues pile up, Yun Jin stays in denial about what Ji Woon is doing. As she scrabbles for alternative explanations to the truth that's right in front of her, we find ourselves both understanding and condemning her. Can't be Ji Woon doing this, it just can't be. It has to be a psychotic fan behind these murders. Or maybe she's just so paranoid and scared of letting her success slip away that she's imagining connections where none exist. Yeah, sure, that's it. Because the alternative, well, it, it's unthinkable. You might like to think, that in her shoes you would look into it, maybe talk to the police or Ji Woon or even investigate yourself. But not everyone's a hero. We can't all be Elodie Rokoto or Zarina Kassia risking life and limb to find the truth. Many of us are just people, content to accept the explanation that is convenient for us. Because less hassle than questioning the world in front of us. We've seen Yun Jin grow up from childhood, watched her climb the ranks through hard work, and she's been completely willing to use other people to do it. Not in any sort of malicious way, mind you, it's just business. And now that she's faced with actual responsibility at her own personal cost, she shies away from it because she doesn't want to give up what she's earned. And whether she fully realises it or not, that hesitance to up to the plate cost a lot of people their lives at Ji Woon's hands. Eventually, the trickster fell out of favour at Mighty One, and the executives began to turn on Yun Jin and her star. Once again, dramatic irony kicks in, 
as the gulf between Ji Wun's and Yun Jin's perspectives illuminates the differences between the two of them. Ji Wun believed Yun Jin supported him in the boardroom, but we know that Yun Jin accepted the board's complaints that Ji Wun's music had stopped selling. The two were given three months to turn things around, and Yun Jin set to work to save her and Ji Wun's careers. But it was only when Ji Wun had completed his masterpiece did the two stories realign in the trickster's bloody finale. As Ji Wun murdered his way through Mighty One's executives, Yun Jin had to reckon with what her inaction had done. All those people, the fans he'd killed, the executives she was forced to watch slaughtered on the stage, had died because she had denied her instincts and ignored what was right in front of her. But interestingly, as the performance comes to a finale, there's no real introspection from Yun Jin. She doesn't blame herself for what's happened, at least she doesn't seek forgiveness or atonement. She's angry because Ji Wu misled her and has ruined everything she worked for. And honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. Yun Jin has never been the kind of woman to look back at her past. Why would she? There's too much to do here and now. Spend too much time thinking about what you could have done, or what you're responsible for, or you miss what's happening right now. You miss an opportunity that could cost you later. That philosophy has gotten her from a dingy basement, cradling her sister in the night, to the heights of Seoul society, and the one time she took something for granted, the one time she gave Ji Woon the benefit of the doubt, she lost everything. Why would she even consider her own guilt? Someone like her would never consider responsibility for the people that she'd hurt, because what's the point? The entity's intervention buys her a second chance, just as Ji Woon is about to tie up loose ends and finish her off. When the fog envelops her, Yun Jin decides that the best thing she can do now isn't to mope about the people who suffered from her actions, but to get back on her feet. Yun Jin's goal is to earn everything back all over again, to claw her way back up and make Ji Woon pay for what he took from her. In many ways, she bears more similarities to the more human killers, like the Death Slinger or the Twins, than she does to her fellow survivors. She's been wronged by those around her so badly that she's erased all notions of goodwill and camaraderie. She's in it for herself, and damn anyone who stands in her way. As such, it's only fitting that the entity doesn't just snatch her up like it does to the other survivors. It presents the fog and its promises to her not as purgatory, but as an opportunity. The entity promised Yun Jin the chance to show what she's truly made of, to get her own back on Ji Woon and claim the fame and glory that she always wanted, that she'd spent her whole life working for. This makes Yun Jin arguably the first survivor to enter the fog willingly, at least her motivations for doing so kind of similar to the Death Slinger. The entity offered an abstract promise of vengeance and fulfilment, and Yun Jin, at least at first, jumped to the chance to take it. Whether this was exactly what she had in mind, well, let's just say she's probably regretting that decision now. If I had to use a word to describe Yun Jin's story, it's refreshing. With such a stark divide between this game's survivors and killers, there's always a lot of moralising between the two sides, both in the game's lore and in its divided player base. But Yun Jin's lore reads more like killer lore than the lore of her prior survivors, like Elodie or Zarina, because it explicitly rejects any attempt to moralise its story. Once again, the moral ambiguity reminds me a lot of the Death Slinger story, where it was all told from Kaled's perspective, and the story didn't tell you what to think about him, in favour of just showing you his life and thoughts, and letting you come to your own conclusions. It respects the intelligence of the reader by not telling you what to think about Yun Jin and her actions. By telling the story using Yun Jin's amoral eyes, it doesn't condemn her or vindicate her for what she does. That's why she's such a divisive character for a lot of people. I've met as many hardcore Yun Jin stands who love her no-nonsense attitude and philosophy of self-interest as I have people who think she's just annoying, nasty, and deserves everything she gets in the trials. Me, I'm a bit of both. I love that the story offers an explanation for Yun Jin's actions without excusing them. Her attitude and evasion of responsibilities is understandable and human, but that doesn't make them justified. She's a complex character, especially by survivor standards, and I appreciate her for that, even if I think what she did was thoroughly reprehensible. Her story is one of the most mature stories a survivor in this game has ever had, because it had the courage to pull its character away from being a hero in favour of being human, with all the selfish flaws the humans are known for having. And nowhere is this clearer than when you compare her story to Ji Woon's. 
Despite his story sharing many events with Yun Jin's, the Trixus character is actually built and presented very differently. Yun Jin is a complex character with dubious moral standings, and a lot of the onus left on the reader to make sense of her and decide for themselves whether she's a good person or not. The trickster is anything but complex. Instead, he's almost cartoonishly evil, discarding all attempt at subtlety in favour of flashy style and outlandish clothing. In terms of character complexity, comparing Yun Jin to Ji Woon is like comparing John Kramer to Mr. Tumble. This is why I honestly think that Ji Woon works better as a secondary character in Yun Jin's story than he does as the main character of his own. He's just too flat. In Yun Jin's story, he's a source of threat and mystery, while being at the same time necessary for Yun Jin's career, which is her most important thing. He's the source of the conflict in the story, the conflict that Yun Jin faces when she starts to see the clues to Ji Woon's murder spree piling up. His actions force Yun Jin to decide whether she wants to throw her career away by reporting Ji Woon to the police, or keep her head down and hope it all blows over. Without him, Yun Jin's character would be less well defined, because the primary decision point that showcases to the reader who she is would never have happened. And yet, despite how important he is in realising Yun Jin's character, Ji Woon doesn't have that depth in his own story. He can't see further than two feet in front of his own face, because he's too busy being evil to actually notice the world around him. While Yun Jin is integrated extremely well into the corporate world of K-pop, Ji Woon really isn't because, again, his story is too focused on him and his Saturday morning cartoon villain levels of sadism and viciousness. Ji Woon's involvement in Yun Jin's life builds her into her world and defines who she is. But the same isn't true the other way around because the story is too busy reveling in the evilness of his actions to care. This is why I fully believe that Yun Jin is the best part of the All Kill chapter, and the first survivor to steal the show from her counterpart killer. She feels disarmingly real, and the writers respect the reader's ability to notice that, and let you make your own decisions about whether you like her or not. And I think Behaviour knew this too, because look at the marketing for the chapter. We had pictures of Yun Jin's blue outfit plastered over the internet. Dead by Daylight changed their Twitter handle to Magnum Opus and gave us Yun Jin's shadowed face as their avatar. They even mocked up posts from her as just a cup of coffee and pictures of her eyes. Most other survivors don't get that kind of focus, so clearly someone at Behaviour knew that Yun Jin was more than most other survivors. I've heard people claim that Yun Jin was designed to be the next Feng Min or Jane Romero, a down to earth girl boss type figure that would draw the player base to her and thus drive skin sales. But you know what? Even if I could find that kind of character to be a little tiresome when they're overused, and even if it were a decision made cynically, I can massively appreciate Yun Jin's story for what it is. A genuinely mature take on the amoral corporate world of K-pop that makes for a real change of pace from the grand concept and ancient conspiracies of Felix and Elodie's stories that directly preceded her own. Ji Woon might be the one with his name in lights, but Yun Jin is the real star of the All Kill chapter. Finally, the trickster, Yun Jin, the nurse, and Yui. That's all kill and tome six all completed. Now maybe I can take a bit of a breather. Wait, hang on, ha hang on a moment. What? Okay, so tome seven, Forsaken, featuring Law for the Plague and Bill, comes out alongside a Left 4 Dead event and the Crypt TV skins. And Resident Evil has now been confirmed, meaning that I am going to have to go back on my old video and look over everything I've already said with regards to revelations that are coming apparently in a month's time. Okay then. I <laughs> guess the law guy's work is never done. And you can help that work by subscribing to the channel because goddamn, this next month or two is going to be kind of crazy. If you want more from me, I stream every Wednesday and Sunday, 7.30pm GMT over on Twitch. And you can find me on Twitter as well if you want to ask me any inane questions that come to your mind. If you really want to support the channel, you can look at my Patreon or my Ko-fi links that are in the description along with my other socials. So please do take a look. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you for the next one. Ta-ta for now.